All right, I've been getting some questions about homework 5D. I think we kind of covered 5C in a previous lecture. Why not hit 5D as well? I'm not going to do the whole thing. But I've got to talk about what it's supposed to be doing. Because some people said, I just really don't get it. And, you know, I can understand that. What is it doing? Well, a lot of people just did A and B and didn't go do C, D, and F. So, you know, you only got like three points out of ten if you only did A and B, and you're supposed to come back and do C, D, and whoops, I said F. C, D, and E. Just go back in and do them. You know, I'm not taking a whole bunch off for late homework at this point, so go ahead, get them done. You know, just get them done as soon as possible. So what is what are these supposed to be doing? Well, you scroll down here, and it explains the purpose of the script. Now, if it doesn't make sense after you read the little explanation, um, that's okay, but you might ask me about it. So what is FindMax supposed to do? As the string is processed, display the value of each digit in the string and the current max digit found at that moment in the loop. So apparently we're going to pass it a string. It's kind of what S is implying there, but this tells you. The argument, what is S? It's a string of digits. 4, 1, 5, 4, 3. Now, we're cooler than this, and we've been using lists, right, to pass series of numbers around. But this is just going to go ahead and use a string to carry a series of digits. And so what's it supposed to do? It's supposed to scroll. It's supposed to step through the string looking for the largest number. And just to let us know where it's at. Yeah, zoom in there. Just to let us know where it's at, it's supposed to uh, print the largest one found. Right, so it's going to print a 4, and yeah, 4 is the largest. Then it's going to print a 1, and it's going to say, yeah, but 4 was still the largest. Then it's going to print a 5, and okay, 5 is larger now. So it's going to say, found a 5, 5 is the largest. Then it's going to print a 4, and nope, 5 is the largest. Then it's going to print a 3, and nope, 5 is the largest. So that's what it's supposed to do, and that's what this flow chart is for. Now, if you didn't take fundamentals, or you kind of slept through the days on flow charts, which is understandable, then maybe a little bit hard to read. But the way it works is we have some set statements. Those are just like C equals zero and max V equals negative one. <coughs> and a while statement, a while statement is pretty clear. And where it says yes, you know, it would just be a while and then a colon. And we have a couple more statements. This is just pulling an element. Well, C looks like our counter, while C is less than the length of the string. It's gonna keep going. It's gonna pull letters out of the string and then it's going to turn them into numbers. Otherwise, we don't can't process them as digits, right? It's a string. You can't do math on a string. So we pull each letter out, and we turn it into a number so that then we can do something with it. We can check to see if it's larger than the max value. Well, our max value starts off at negative 1, so the first time it finds a number, it's definitely going to be larger than negative 1. And if it is larger than the max value, then set that to our max value. It then prints some information out, increment C, and keep doing that. So all of this stuff is indented inside the while loop and then unindented after the while loop is a print statement. And so this is a DEF, it's a function. You're supposed to be able to call the function if, in order to prove that it works. If you gave the uh, code to me and it didn't have a test of it, right? You didn't actually show that it worked. I had to edit your file, and I had to put that in there, and I usually found out that it didn't work. So, you know, you had to prove that it works. I think I mentioned that here. Well, I guess not. But anyways, if you, if, you know, for the folks who didn't call the functions and I tested them by putting them in myself, I put that in your feedback, and I said, hey, put the test code in it and get them to work. So that way you'll get your grade. So I just want to do DEF find max. Quick question. Yes, sir. So... So what we want to take the flow chart, the flow chart, and just write it into code. That was it. Right, we're taking the flow chart and we're turning it into code. Oh, okay. Just making sure. Everybody... Yeah, be uh, if we were doing fundamentals, I'd be making you take code and turn it into flow charts all the time, and vice versa. We're just doing a little of that. I'm not going to make y'all draw flow charts, but yeah, we okay. are taking. I'll just double check now. Yep, yep, yep. Yes, sir. I turned there to the assignment, and you said I've done two out of five. I put. C, D, and E. Oh, my yeah. mistake. My mistake. I'm an idiot. Don't get mad at me. I'll fix it. All right. Can you send me a text message telling me to fix it for you? Yes. All right. That'd be cool. 
Yeah, if I goof up on your uh, on your grades, just send me a text message and I'll fix it. Yes, sir. I actually sent you a text about the exam. Okay. Um, it wasn't unlocked on YouTube. Are you resourcing? That would be a problem. I will unlock it, and you'll get some uh, additional time in order to do it until until uh, next week. Alrighty. Okay. I apologize for that. All right. All right. Okay. I apologize for that. All righty. So. Anyways, let's go ahead and do this one. While I'm at it, let's, uh, before I forget. So by the way, I'm not sure you're able to go in and look at your exam without having a password. Can you see the current results of your exam? Everybody who has it marked as graded. Can you step into it and uh, and see the result? Can you see your grade and then click on that and see the list of your uh, of you know what you got right and what you got wrong? You're shaking your head no. You're saying no, not gonna work. No, I can't. Ask for the password. Like no, I said no reports of that. Maybe mine's not good. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, go back to Quizlet. Click on the little pull down. Click submissions. Like attempt one. Yeah, maybe I'm still good. Okay. Yeah. But that's all it's showing. It's not showing the grade itself. So. Alrighty, just a sec. All right, guys, gonna pause the recording, Molly. So here's how you check your questions on a quiz or on an exam. Go into the quizzes, and then you click on the little pull down, and it'll say submissions. Except it doesn't on mine because I'm not in student mode. But if I switch to student mode, you'd have two like two uh, offerings, reports and submissions. Well, you don't have any reports, but you should have submissions. So just pull on the little pull down and say submissions. Once you're into the exam, you should see your answers. You should see like 0 out of 1 points or 0.5 out of 2 points or something like that. And if it's not just a multiple choice, then usually I'll give you a reason or a hint as to what's wrong. If it's a calculation, if it's doing math in your head, or if it's multiple choice, I probably didn't give you any feedback. If it's uh, something more interesting than that, then you should have feedback. So you got to be able to scroll up and down, see which ones you missed because you didn't get full credit for them, and hopefully get you know good clues as to what went wrong. And you'll want to do that for the exams for the rest of the semester as well, so that you'll be excuse me the quizzes so that when the final finally rolls around in December, you'll be ready to do it. All right, where were we? We were on. I wanted to do this. Then I want to move on to something else after this. Define fine max. Pop open idle and do this if you want. Don't have to, especially if you've done a homework. But here I am. I'm looking at the flow chart here. Define fine max. Okay, cool. Define fine max. And yeah, I had a capital M here, and I'm putting a lower M here just because it's easier to type. So I have some set statements. C is equal to zero. Max V is equal to negative one. Maybe I'll make that lowercase as well. Maybe I'm going to make everything lowercase, just to make it as easy as possible to type. <coughs> and here's my while loop. While C is less than len of s, while C is less than the length of the string, ch is equal to s subscript C. What does that do? Well, since C is equal to 0, it pulls the first character out of the string. Right. 0 is the first position, 1 is the second, so on. So now ch has got a letter in it. Well, it's actually a digit because we're going to be passing digits to it. So since it's a digit, let's convert it to a number so that we can do something with it. I is equal to INTCH. Right now it's a number and we can do something with it. Specifically, we're going to compare it against max. So if it's less than the max, excuse me, if it's greater than max, it becomes the new max. So that's the point of this if statement down here. 
So if i is greater than max v, then that means it becomes the new max. Max v equals i. I think I have that flipped from this if statement, but that's okay. The logic is the same. Right, if max v is less than i, it means the same thing as if i is greater than max v. All righty, and then we need to increment c. But just so that we can see what we're doing, we're going to print out our values here. We like knowing what it's doing. So we're going to print the counter, we're going to print the i, and we're going to print the max value. So this is going to go from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is going to be whatever digit was in the string at that position. And that's going to be the currently tallied max value. But we still have to increment C, or else it'll never leave the loop, and it'll just keep you know, hitting the first character over and over. So C plus equals 1. And by the way, whenever you see plus equals, if you put a space in there, that's going to break it. And don't do that. And good enough. So we can print a done message and we can return max v. How do I know to stop indenting? Because we're outside of the loop. So print done. Return max v. Now, strictly speaking, I guess that's all the assignment asked us to do. It didn't ask you to test them. But if you don't test them, you don't know that it worked. So we're going to find the max of a number. We're going to find max of, you know, 1, 3, 4, 8, 7, 6, something like that, right? And since it returns a value, I could store that as a result. But I don't think my little sample code down here at the bottom showed that. Oh, yeah, it did. It showed us storing it in M. So why not? M equals. And then if I really wanted to, I could print M out to make sure that it worked. Print quote find max returned end quote comma m like that. And by the way, you can put all of these functions in one file if you want, or you can put them in five separate py files. Either one's cool. If you put them in one, you just prefer to do it like do it like an input and everything so you do it all at one time. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool, yeah. Okay. I guess we're on lecture elemental PQR. Let's see how many syntax errors I got. Yeah, that's all right. What did I do wrong? I didn't follow something. I see the error, but I want you all to point it out to me. What's the very first line of my flowchart? Compared, yep. You see what I did wrong, right? Make that an S, just like that. That's why I said variable not found, or whatever the error message was. Okay, so we pass to it the string one three four eight seven six. Be nice if we printed that out before we called it, right? But I didn't. So when the counter is zero, the value is one, and the max found is 1. When the counter is 1, it's at that position. So at position 1, the value is a 3, and so that becomes our new maximum. At position 2, the value is 4, and so that becomes a new maximum. At position 3, we see an 8, so that becomes a new maximum. At position 4, we have a 7. Well, the 8 was larger, so it stays an 8. And then at the last position, position 5, it finds a 6. And that's also not larger than 8, so 8 stays the same. And find max return to 8. Hope that makes a little bit more sense. Are we going to be doing anything else where we pass numbers around as strings and we want to treat them as little, you know, single digits rather than just converting the whole thing to a number? No, we're not. The real point was just to make sure that you could uh, write this program based on flowcharts. <coughs> And I think that a later assignment asks you to change these to support lists rather than strings, right? So that if that was going to work, it's not. Don't type this because it's not going to work. Our uh, function doesn't support it. You know, it would look like this. 
where L, where L was some kind of list that we had previously defined, right? So L was equal to, you know, square braces. Like I said, this is not going to work, so don't even bother diving it, right? So I believe a later assignment asks you to rewrite these programs so that they work with lists. And that's going to be pretty easy, actually. I'm not sure it's hardly going to take any effort at all in this case to do that. I think it I wonder if it'd work. Just as is. Might break. Might not. <laughs> Bizarrely, strings and lists are so closely related that it worked without uh, without any change. So I'm gonna have to recall what the homework assignment was. Alright, anyways. That kind of makes sense. I hope that explains it better. If you didn't turn it in already, please go ahead and do so. If you need to revise it, please do. If I didn't give you full credit and you deserved it because I was a jerk, please send me a text message. We have a low class turnout again. What's going on? All righty. Okay. I wanted to do a little bit more with file I.O. Just because file I.O. is so dang important. And we've been reading stuff from files. Maybe we'll make this program right to a file. But let me tell you what I want it to do. I'm going to make a new data file. And I don't know what I'm going to call it. I'm going to save as, and I'm going to call my data file, um, you know, what's our lecture? R. Okay, data r.txt. Data r. Data r.txt. That's just going to be the name of my, my file that I open up. But I need to change the save as type to txt file if I want that to work. Okay, so what's this file going to contain? It's going to contain some text, but what it is is it's like a form letter. And so it's going to have, not fill in the blanks, but that's the idea. It's going to have fields that get replaced with some data that we calculate from the program. So how about dear name, comma, I heard your favorite Pokemon is dollar sign P O K E in dollar sign period. These are just going to be placeholders that get filled in. That Pokemon stinks. I suggest Charizard. Whatever. And what if they did like Charizard? Well, then the form letter is stupid. But whatever. Sincerely, sender. Like that. Now, what is our file? What is our program going to do? It's going to open this file. It's going to read it in line by line. It's going to replace these little placeholders with good data. And we could print it to the screen or we could save it to a file. Whichever. Saving it to a file would be interesting. Printing it to the screen is a little bit easier. Maybe we'll do both. Maybe we'll do one and then the other. <coughs> so that's going to be my text file. I'm going to kind of put some extra returns in it just so that I can squish it on the side of the screen. You don't need to do that. Okay. All righty. I'm going to comment this stuff down out down here at the bottom. Why? Just because I don't want it to do it anymore. I, we're, we're concentrating on the next part of the program now. So I don't care about that stuff anymore. Can I grab it and pull it over, please? All right. So, we're going to need to open a file name. We could ask the user for the file name, or we could just hard code it. It's always annoying when uh, we're testing stuff over and over and over in this class, and we have to type in input each time we run it. So, I think I'm just going to hard code the file name. File name is equal to, quote, data r dot 
txt. Now there's a couple of tactics, techniques, that I kind of wanted to cover. And I kind of don't want to throw too much stuff at us at one time. But I do want to cover it. When we open the file, if the file doesn't exist, it will throw an error that we can capture with try except. It will throw an exception. In which case, we could loop over and over until they give us a good file name. We didn't even ask them for the file name, so maybe we ought to just quit the program if we can't find it. So let's do that. Let's write a function called open file, which is going to encapsulate the opening of the file <coughs> and then make it error proof. But if it fails, it's just going to kill the program completely with, an, with a sys exit call. Sys exit terminates the shell completely. So df open file. I'm not going to call it open because that's the name of the keyword. That's the name of the built-in function. And it's going to take a file name, fn. Well, why don't you just use that file name? Because I want to kind of genericize this so that I could take this code out of this function, out of this file, and put it in another one. So fn is going to stand for file name, but I'm going to need another one called mode. What's mode? That's like that quote w for writing or quote r for reading. All right, so we're going to try some stuff. We're going to try opening the file. File equals open. Fn comma mode. The reason we're doing that is so down in main, if we do something like this, and don't type this because I may fix it, I may change it anyways. You know, but if I do this, fin is equal to open file. You know, and I pass in a file name, data.txt, like that, comma, read. That almost looks exactly like it did before, where I did open file. I'm trying to simulate that syntax as closely <coughs> as possible, but I'm trying to make this function a little bit safer. Okay, so we're going to try opening it. If that does not fail, we're going to return the file handle. But what if a problem does occur? We're going to need an accept statement to handle that. But something that we haven't shown is that you can capture specific errors. Like what if you don't care about divide by zero errors, but you really do care about uh, file errors? We can specify which error we want to handle. Well, in this case, we're going to handle and type this first three letters in caps, O-S-E, and then the rest of the word error without that, R-R-O-R, -R -R, as E-R-R, -R, colon. What this says is capture that error, store it in a variable called OS error, no, no, excuse me, catch any operating system errors, store that error in a variable called ERR, which we could then check and find out more information about why it failed. I think all we're going to do is print that and then kill the program, but that's all right. So let's print them an error message. Print could not open end quote comma fn. Print quitting with error code, end quote, comma. And as part of this ERR variable that we got as part of the accept statement, an error code is part of it. So ERR dot ERRNO. And it's okay if you don't totally get this, right? It's just the first time you've seen it, and it's something that we haven't seen in the book. So first time. First time's OK. And now we need to quit the program. Maybe that's not a friendly thing to do, but sys.exit, parentheses, err. err. You know.
All right. Bless you. Every time I write a bunch of code, I like to test it immediately. I don't want to write 10 pages of code and then start testing it. I could test this right away. I'm going to do that. Open file, and I'm going to give it a bad file name because that's kind of what I'm curious about. All right, I just typed in some garbage there. And I'm going to run it, and I'm going to see what it does. I'm, I'm just doing this to make sure it compiles. And it blows up. Open file, missing one required positional argument. That means when I called open file, it wanted two. I didn't pass in enough arguments, and it's telling me which one I didn't pass in, mode. And it's right. I did not pass in the second parameter, which is the mode. So now it should say open file, parentheses, quote, some bad file name, comma, quote, r quote. I'm going to test it again. Nope, sys is not defined. Okay, that's a library. So I'm just going to add an import sys up here above the EF open file. I really ought to scroll it up and put it at the top of my program. If you feel like scrolling up and putting it at the top of your program, that's cool. All right, and it gives me an error message. Could not open asdfasdf.tx, quitting with error code 2. Now, honestly, I don't know what that error code means, right? Um, what if I try to open for a drive letter that doesn't exist, like Z colon slash? Uh, this is just my experiment. I, I want to see if it's a different error code. No. All right, whatever. Now, what if I specify a good file name? Well, I had this up here, file name equals. So I'm going to pass in, as part of my good test, that as my file name. And I'm going to hope it works. I'm going to hope it doesn't show up with that error. It seems to have worked. At least it didn't print anything, so I expect that it worked. Now, did I have to encapsulate it like this? No. But I could put this in a loop, and I could make them type in file names until they type in one that's actually valid. That would be a better use of this, right? If it says, we could put while here, while true, we could try it. And if there's an error, we could print out the error, and then we could tell them to type it in again, give us a new file name. That might be better. While we're sitting here looking at it, let's go ahead and do that. That's going to take just a little bit of doing to get it spaced out correctly. I'm going to just hit the space bar two times. No, no, I'm not going to cheat. I'm going to do the whole thing correctly. You see all this stuff? Tab it over so that we can include it as part of our while loop. Like that. And then do while true, capital T. All right, and if we capture an error with the accept statement, we tell them that it's a problem, and then we ask for a new file name. fn is equal to open. What file should we open? Question mark. End quote. Parentheses. And I'm just going to comment these two things out because it's not going to exit in this case. I'm going to change this back to being a bad file name. Well, first I'm going to run it and make sure that it works correctly. All right, it didn't return any messages at all, so I guess it worked. I'm going to give it a garbage file name so that I can test it out. Junk.txt. I know that file doesn't exist. I want to <coughs> test it out. I want to test my function out. And it blew up. Invalid argument. Oh, that's dumb. Somebody has a guess as to what I really wanted that to be, and it's not an open statement. Input? Yeah, that should be an input because we're asking the user. So change that open there. All right. 
it could not open junk.txt. What file should we open? I'm going to type in another bad file name. Nope, that one didn't work either. Okay, data r.txt. Great, it worked. It found the file it opened. So this is a function that's cool enough that I might just want to stick it, you know, in a .py file somewhere and then either paste it into the next program I write or do an import of that program into this one, into the next one that I write. Because it's nice to be able to, that's called encapsulation, right? I wouldn't want to have to write all eight or nine lines of code there every time I wanted to open a file in some kind of fail-safe fashion. And as is, if we called open and the file didn't exist, it would have blown up on us. It would quit the program rather than giving them the chance to type it in again. All right, it's about time to make sure that everybody's got this going. I don't want to type in 20 more lines of code. All right, so once we get the file open, we're going to read it. We've seen how to do this before. We've done for loops. What we usually did is we used a for loop, and then we trimmed the data. And then we converted it to a number. Well, this time we're not going to convert it to a number because it's not numbers, it's text, right? It looks like that. But we are going to open it. Let's uh, do, let me scroll this up. All right, let's put a comment here. Go through file, printing each line, replacing keywords. <clears throat> and we're going to support two keywords at this point. No, actually, I guess we had three. Sender name, poke, and just name. So I guess we better create some things to hold those. So let's do name is equal to Joe Bob. That's going to be the recipient. And then poke is equal to his, his Pikachu. And our name is equal to, you know. Pikachu? Pardon me? Pikachu? Yeah, that's going to be my favorite. You can put whatever you want to in there. Okay. Sender is equal to your conscience. All right. So now we need our cute little for loop that's going to step through this file. I've got a mistake here, though, because I open the file, but I don't return a handle for it. I'm just going to give it a clever name, like in file. I-N-F-I-L-E equals open file, like that. Just like if, if I hadn't written that function, this is what it would look like, right? That's what we've done in the past. Uh, now we've got our cool new open file function. Same syntax, though. So for line in I-N-F-I-L-E colon for every line of data in in file. Let's strip it. Line equals line dot strip. And let's check for our keywords. Let's check for the dollar sign keyword. I mean the name, if, quote, and I ought to define these as consonants, but anyways, if, quote, dollar sign, N-A-M-E, dollar sign, end quote, and then the word in, space, line, space, we're going to replace it. Line dot replace, parentheses, that same keyword, I could just copy and paste it, save myself some typing time. And what do I want to replace it with? I want to replace it with Joe Bob or whatever that name is. Like that. And I'm going to do the same two things for the Pokemon and for the Cinder. If quote 
dollar sign P O K E, end quote. I think I forgot a dollar sign when I was reading that out to you. Hopefully you can see it. In line colon, line dot replace, parentheses, and then that same string. Again, I'm just going to copy and paste it. Copy. Now see, by the time you find yourself copying and pasting something like that, you should have defined it as a, uh, as a variable. Okay. And what am I going to replace it with? I'm going to replace it with the contents of that variable. And now I'm going to do the same thing for sender, but I think I'm just going to copy both lines of text and paste them and change that to sender. That's probably going to be even faster. I'm going to copy those last two lines. Copy, paste, and change poke to sender. All right, now that we've done all that replacing, hopefully we have some good data, so I'm going to print the line out. I'm going to tab back one, because I don't only want to print it out if that was in the line. Then print the line. <coughs> you didn't replace the last sender. It's still poked. Oh, you're right, you're right. I knew. I always run into a problem when I copy-paste like that. You see that poke? That needs to be sender there, because I'm replacing the sender keyword. Or Pikachu could send a letter saying he's your favorite. Look. <coughs> now I'm going to stop. I'm going to back space all the way to the end, and then I'm going to close our file. In file.close, like that. file should we open data r.txt and it didn't work at all my code failed completely dear dollar sign name I heard your favorite Pokemon is dollar okay I made a dumb mistake whenever you do dot replace like that it doesn't actually change anything it just returns a new string with that con with that modification made to it so this needs to be line equals line dot replace and I apologize for that error. We're going to have to fix it in three. Every time we call line.replace, we need to put this line equals in front of it. Line equals line.replace. And then line equals line.replace. Just like that. Data r.txt. All right, and there it works. Dear Joe Bob. I heard your favorite Pokemon is Pikachu. That Pokemon stinks. I suggest Charizard. Sincerely, your conscience. So that worked. We've written kind of a form letter kind of thing. You know, we could save this out to a file. Uh, I, I don't think that would add much to the example. Right, but we could open another file and we could write each line of data out to the file. And eh, it won't take that long. Let's do that. I want to make sure everybody's got it working up to this point, though. It's only going to take about three changes to get it so that it saves this to an output file. Oh, let's change junk.txt back to our real file name so that we don't have to keep typing it in every time. Data r.txt. All right, we need to open a file there. We're going to so we're going to add an open file call there after we get our line and print it out. We're going to want to write it to a file. We're going to need to close both files. And then maybe just for fun, we'll launch Notepad to see that file. If you're doing this on a PC, I'm not sure how you're going to do it on a Mac. If you're doing it on a Mac at home, then uh, you can skip that last part. OK, but we need an output file. Out, out file equals open file. And I'm putting this right under the end file. What's my output going to be called? How about just output.txt, end quote, comma. But we're going to be saving to this one, so it needs to be a W. Or it could be an A for a pending, but we want to recreate it each time. 
So we just added this. Just putting a few marks there. You don't need to do that. I'm just doing that to flag it down. Down here where we print the line, let's write to output, outfile. So outfile.write, parentheses, line. Oh, and then we have to add a carriage return. So line plus, quote, backslash, whoopsie, how'd you get down there? Line plus, quote, <coughs> backslash, well, oh, this keyboard is so different. Backslash in, end quote, in parentheses. Then we need to close the file because we got to close both of them. So that was my second change. Here's my third change, outfile.close. And then, like I said, just for funsies, let's open that file. We're going to launch a command. We're going to run just like I was at the uh, command prompt. You know, like if I was at CMD and I typed in notepad f space file name, you know, it would launch the notepad application so I could view a text file or create a text file. We're going to be telling the operating system that we want to run another executable file. I don't think we've done this. To do that, we're going to need to import another library. Import OS. And then we're going to make a system call. So the next line is going to be os.system. Parentheses, quote. What program are we running? Notepad. And like I said, not going to work for the Mac users and the Linux users. You'll, you'll have to figure it out on your own if you want to do this. Okay. End quote. Make sure you have that space there, though. Space, end quote, plus out file. The reason we're doing that is because that it'll pop up Notepad and we can immediately see our output. I'm going to add a comment. Launch Notepad to view file. <coughs> All right, I wonder if by some miracle it's going to work. Yeah, what do you know? Blew up. Can only concatenate string, not IO text wrapper. Well, that's funny. When I wrote it earlier today, it worked. Well, we may not spend a lot of time on it if I can't get it to work. Take out the notepad part. Oh. Oh. My mistake. Remember where I did output.txt? I never stored that in a file name. So I don't know what file to open down here. I'm going to be totally lame rather than fix that and just do it like this. Quote, notepad space output.txt. Is that lame? Yeah, I should store this in a variable so that I can use it in both places. All right, it ran. It popped up. Nope, it popped up Notepad with the contents of my letter, <coughs> and so I could print it out, or I could copy and paste it into my email program, or whatever I wanted to do there. So one reason I wanted to show you that is just to show you that you can call other programs from your Python program. You want to create an HTML file and then launch your browser pointing it at the HTML file. You can do that. Pretty much you could launch any command, any application that your operating system supports. I'm going to delete some files, put a DEL space star dot star in there. Don't do that. But it would do it. <laughs> I 
Now, honestly speaking, I don't think you need these if statements. I don't think the replace statement crashes if it doesn't exist in the line. But I did want to remind you of that syntax. It also works for lists. If item in list, then do something with it, right? If something in list, do something with it. If something else is in that string, then do something with it. Wanted to remind you of that syntax, even though in this particular case, I think if we commented out the if statements or deleted them and untabbed these over, it would work. So with that in mind, I'm going to untab that, untab that, untab that, and then just comment out those lines because they're not necessary. You could even delete them if you don't think, if you don't like them cluttering up your code. I need to scroll up or down. All righty. Tell me where to stop. It's the way I get the output. All right, I'll come look at your code. It just says the output, not the time. So so here's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to change my form letter so it's an HTML file. So when I create it. I need to I want it to be called .html so that Windows will launch the browser to view it. So I'm going to change this line output.txt to output.html like that. Whoops, not html, <coughs> html. The only other thing I need to do is I need to scroll down you know what? Uh, it's really, really lame for me to not have these as uh, as uh, variables. I'm still not going to fix that. But where it says output.html, I'm going to scroll down and replace the call to Notepad with that. So down here, I'm going to delete all that, and I'm going to do quote output.html. Just open the file that we created earlier. And now it's not going to be launch notepad, but I'm just going to save view file as my little comment. But for that to work, I need to change my data r.txt form letter to actually be HTML. Now if you've looked at HTML before, this stuff is going to look familiar. If you haven't, it won't, but that's all right. All right, so every HTML document is going to start with this. These are called tags, and they begin with less than signs, and they end with greater than signs. So HTML, end tag, and then we need another one, body, end tag, and then every line needs to begin with a less than P greater than. So I'm just going to copy that and paste it a bunch. And every line needs to end with a variant of that called a closing tag. What's the variant look like? Less than slash P greater than. And this is the slash that's underneath the question mark. It's not the backslash. So, and then just copy that and paste it all the way down as well. That means paragraph of text. And then at the bottom, we're going to need to have a close body tag. So it's going to say slash body and then a close HTML tag. So it's going to say slash HTML. So less than slash body greater than and less than slash HTML greater than. And we're going to talk about this again in a pretty soon, a couple of weeks when we start talking about JavaScript because you have to have HTML in order to use JavaScript. <coughs> now this is incredibly simple HTML. It's like 1994 level HTML, but that's okay. Got to start somewhere. So now when I run my program, if I haven't goofed it up, 
it should read our form letter. It should write in, you know, Joe Bob and Pikachu and whatever. But it's going to save it as an HTML file. And it's going to have the HTML tags in it so that when we launch the browser to view it, we'll actually see it. So here goes. Going to run it. Hope it works. And there it is. And went ahead and launched Microsoft's browser in order to view it. Could we make it a lot of lot prettier? Yeah, we could. You know, we could use all sorts of HTML and CSS formatting commands to make it look like a really pretty website. But that's good enough. <coughs> so our same code was able to handle both circumstances, right? With only a very minor change. We just changed the uh, name of the extension or the extension of the file name, right? We changed it to .html and the rest of it worked. All right. Hope that's clear. Hope that made sense. I almost don't have any other lecture that I want to move on to past this point. We might end early and then people have questions about homework. can hang out and talk about that for a few minutes.